Good evening, everyone. Glad to have you with us tonight and Thursday in the Word. And um, we appreciate you joining with us in this time that we sit down and we take a little look at um, what the Scripture's talking about on, on things that we feel are very foundational to our experience and our walk with Christ. Um, God has blessed us, and, and one of the things that we have to make sure that we do is that um, uh, we learn His Word. And there are some things that we look at that are foundational, I believe are foundational to every Christian's life that will help them to grow up and mature to become what God has called them to be. And I know that without these things, um, I believe people waver to the right and left. And the Bible teaches us um, that we're not to go to the right or the left, that we're stay focused on Jesus Christ. We're not to be double-minded people. Because anybody that's double-minded, we know the Word of God tells us that they are unstable in all their ways. And so it's important for us to um, know the Word, to experience the Word, and to go deep into the Word. And, and so we've been talking here. We started out a little bit ahead of ourselves during this uh, time that was shut down. And we started out on faith toward God. And we've worked our way through to the doctrine of baptisms. And tonight we're going to start on the last lesson of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We've already talked about um, concerning the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Um, how, how that um, the Holy Spirit was predicted. We talked about Old Testament generation. Um, how that the Old Testament believers, they drank from the same spiritual rock that you and I drink from. That rock was Christ. Um, we talked about the Holy Spirit baptism being predicted and promised um, by Jesus while he was on the face of this earth and uh, how that uh, uh, the Holy Spirit baptism um, was received um, by those that um, uh, were at the day of Pentecost but also ongoing um, in Jerusalem. We also talked about hindrances to receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is traditions of men, sometimes church doctrine, uh, philosophies of men, and then also misinterpretation of Scripture. Um, and then that the Holy Spirit baptism is a separate experience from our salvation experience when we give our life and heart to Jesus Christ. Um, in order for us to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, repentance has had to have first taken place. Then last week we talked about have tongues ceased, are tongues necessary, and this week we're going to talk about do all speak in tongues. Do all speak in tongues. Because we want to clear it up because a lot of people say today, well, you know what, you don't have to speak. It's not necessary to speak in tongues. You don't have to speak in tongues. Not everybody speaks in tongues. And so what are they talking about though? We want to make sure that when, we're, when we are talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we have to differentiate between the Holy Spirit baptism being received and then when we're talking about the Holy Spirit operating of the gifts, which is two different things. One, we're being baptized in the Holy Spirit and the baptizer is Jesus. When we're talking about the operation of the gifts of the Spirit, we're talking about the one who operates those is the Holy Spirit in us, and he operates them through us. And the Bible says he does it severally as he wills. In other words, it is by his will. And our role is to pray and ask God what gift is needed at the moment. If, if we're in a place and there's somebody there that needs healing, we are to pray for um, the gift of faith and the gift of healing and for the gift of miracles to take place. That the Holy Spirit would operate those things through us. Um, if we are in a place to where we are needing discernment, we need to ask for the gift of discernment to function, to operate. If we're somewhere where it's needful for a word of knowledge or the word of wisdom, we need to ask for those gifts. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit gives as he wills. And so we want to address this, do all speak with tongues tonight, and look at that um, from the Scripture. A very common misconception um, centers on the misinterpretation of 1 Corinthians 12, 30. 
And that passage of scripture says, do all have the gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Question mark. Do all interpret? In this verse and the surrounding verses, Paul is not talking about the Holy Spirit baptism, but he's talking rather about the gifts of the Spirit and the ministries that are expected to manifest in the church and operate through Spirit-filled believers. 1 Corinthians 12 does not teach anywhere concerning the Holy Spirit baptism. It's not even mentioned. If you want to study about the evidence of the Holy Spirit baptism, you should look at the scriptures that deal with Holy Spirit baptism. Like Mark 16, 17, it says, And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. There's a difference between the gift of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The Greek word doria is used whenever the Holy Spirit is the gift that is being given. The Greek word charisma is used whenever the Holy Spirit is the one who is giving the gift. When we study the scriptures, we must determine whether the Holy Spirit is the gift or the giver. On the day of Pentecost, they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. They were Holy Spirit baptized that day into the Holy Spirit, and they were given the gift of the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the believers there who had already been given the gift of the Holy Spirit were now operating in the gifts of the Spirit, which is operated by the Holy Spirit through believers who have been baptized into the Holy Spirit. This means the Holy Spirit is the giver and not the gift. The Greek word um, gene is used in verses 10, 28, and 30 in conjunction with tongues. It means kinds of tongues or different types of tongues. These verses deal with the gift of tongues, not the evidence or the gift of, of the Holy Spirit. Some scriptures where the Holy Spirit is the giver of the gifts or the charismatas or 1 Corinthians 2, 4 through 11, it says, There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are, manifest, uh, there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. We also look at, at, at you know, different scriptures um, that are that are talking about um, the gifts, the scriptures where the Holy Spirit is get the gift being given, um, uh, the Doria we already talked about. I'm not going to read all these scriptures over again. Um, we've already talked about them prior, but you look at Acts 2:38 where the Holy Spirit was poured. At Acts 10:45, Acts 11:15 through 17, John 7:39. And we talk about um, the charisma, the gift of tongues, not the evidence of the Holy Spirit baptism. This means the Holy Spirit is the giver and not the gift. The Greek word gene is used in verses, like I said, 10, 28, and 30 in conjunction with tongues. It means kinds or different kinds or types. The, this verse deals um, with the gift of tongues. When we are talking about Holy Spirit baptism, we talk about the initial evidence of receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and I, I just read that 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 11, but also look at 1 Corinthians 12, 28, and it says, and God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second um, prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. 1 Corinthians 12, 30, 31, he says, do all have gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? but earnestly desire the best gifts. In other words, desire the one that is needed at that moment. And yet I show you a more excellent way. And, what, and when he goes on, he says, 
the more excellent way is love. He starts out in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He, said, he, he tells us, if I understand or speak with the tongues of men and of angels and understand all mysteries and have all knowledge, what good is it if I don't have love? Love is the more excellent way. That doesn't mean there's no need for the gifts of the Spirit, but yet everything that we do should be motivated and should be done because of the love of God that we have, not so that we can display any gifts. And, and so Romans uh, chapter um, 6, verse 23, he, he talks about, um, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Talking about the charismata or the gift that's given, not the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In salvation, we can easily see that it's the Holy Spirit that, that gives and has get, been given to impart life. The gift that is received, though, is Jesus. In the Holy Spirit baptism, the Holy Spirit is given to impart power, and in that, Jesus is the giver. We must understand that the epistle to the Corinthians was written to believers who had already received the Holy Spirit baptism and were re already manifesting the gifts of the Spirit Knowing And when we think about that, if we know this, it helps us when we deal with uh, another common misconception of the Holy Spirit baptism. And that is, what's the purpose of praying in the Spirit, praying in tongues? But we, we want to make sure that we understand um, in the book of Acts, we're looking at the Holy Spirit baptism being given. The gift was the Holy Spirit. The giver, the baptizer was Jesus. In 1 Corinthians Chapter 12, 13, when it's talking about tongues and talking about the gifts um, that are operating, he's not talking about the Holy Spirit as the gift. He's talking about the Holy Spirit is the baptizer operator of the gifts that's being operated in believers who have been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And so when we look at that, what's the purpose of us praying in tongues? You know, Paul said, I would that you all pray in tongues. I pray in the Spirit more than all of you. And he's not just talking about there animated praying. He's not just talking about that we're all excited about praying. He's talking about praying in the Spirit or praying in tongues. And so what's the purpose of praying in tongues when we, when we look at that? Um, we look at... Um, we, we need to understand some people use Acts 2, 5 through 17 to argue that tongues were a dispensational gift used for evangelism only in the early days of the inception of the church. And, and we all know Acts chapter 2 talks about um, what happened on the day of Pentecost and Peter getting up. And uh, we, we know that all of them saw what took place on the day of Pentecost. They came out of the upper room after um, cloven tongues like as a fire had set upon them. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And when they came out, they were under the influence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He had come and taken his residence in them. They were the temples of God. We are the temples of God. And the Holy Spirit moved into the Holy of Holies there. And they came out under the influence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And those that were watching who had gathered in Jerusalem looked at them and said and talked that they were drunk on wine. So we know Peter then, though, took this as an opportunity to declare the message. And he begins to speak to them concerning the fact that they had all heard them speak in tongues and praise God in their own language. And they were all amazed, and they, and they said, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? How is it that we hear and we hear them speak in our own language in which we were born? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, and Pontus, and Asia, Pergia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya, joining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans, Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying one to another, whatever could this be? Other people mocking said, 
they are full of new wine. But then Peter stood up and proclaimed to them the message that was spoken by the prophet Joel that God was going to, in the last days, pour out his spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters um, would prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. A lot of people say, well, this is what was used early on in the church, just as a time in that dispensation for evangelism. But yet quite the contrary, verses 5 through 11, along with Acts 10, 46, which says, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Um, show that they weren't evangelizing, but rather glorifying and magnifying God. In that Acts 10, 46 passage, we know that that is where Peter is giving an explanation to the Jewish believers and the apostles who were in Jerusalem on the Gentiles, Cornelius' house, receiving Jesus Christ, but also being baptized in the Holy Spirit. How do you know, Peter? How do you know that they received the Holy Spirit as we did? These people that gave their hearts to God, these Gentile people, how do you know they did? How do you know they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit even as we do? did because we I heard them we heard them speak with tongues and magnify God the people in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost heard them speaking in tongues and glorifying and magnifying um, God <clears throat> so we know that evangelism followed afterwards in verses 12 through 40 to clear up the parent confusion confusing opinions embraced by many as a result hearing the disciples speak in tongues. It, it sure is a nice theory, but it is, has no scriptural basis. Acts 2 records tongues as the evidence of the gift of the Holy Spirit, the Doria, not the gift of tongues, the charisma. This explains why tongues needed no interpretation. If there were 50 nationalities in a church service today where believers were speaking in tongues, they would not need an interpretation for they too would hear God being magnified in their own tongue. The real purpose of praying in tongues is clearly set forth in 1 Corinthians 14, 2 through 6, 12 through 19. Let's look at that. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation to, and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. So we can see that uh, one of the purposes of us praying in the spirit, us praying in tongues, is that we would be edified. That the inner man would be strengthened and built up. But he who prophesies, in other words, he speaks a word from God in a known tongue, edifies the whole church. Paul says, I wish you all spoke in tongues, verse 5, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesied is greater than he who spoke with tongues, unless indeed that tongue is interpreted that the church may receive edification. He didn't say that there should not be someone who speaks in tongues. But he said, if they do, the greater edification for the church would be that tongue would be interpreted. Verse six, he says, but now brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying or by teaching? He didn't say, he didn't say for you not to go speaking in tongues. But what he's saying is, if I came to you speaking in tongue with the tongues, what would I profit you? Because you would not understand that unless it was interpreted to you. But if I came to you speaking by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by teaching, then you would be edified. Why? Because it's not edifying for you right now if, if Jerry Westerfield would just start speaking in tongues. I would be edified, I would be encouraged, I would be strengthened because I would be speaking the mysteries, I would be praying to God in the Spirit 
and the enemy doesn't have no clue what I'm praying or what I'm speaking. But you would not be edified. So it's better that I come teaching you or it's better that I would prophesy to you something that you understand or know so that all can be edified. All can be lifted up. He went on to say in verses 12 through 19, even so you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. Therefore, let him who speaks in tongues pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the spirit, and I will also sing with the understanding. Otherwise, if you bless with the spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks? since he does not understand what you say. For you indeed give thanks well, but the other is not edified. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. Yet in the church, I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. And all of that that I just read to you, not once does Paul condemn the speaking in tongues or the praying in the Spirit. He's just trying to get a church, the Corinthians, who were having issues with excelling in the gifts but not the fruit, he was trying to get them to see that if they just lifted up their hands in church and spoke in tongues like a lot of Pentecostal churches find themselves doing, then they are not edifying the whole church. They're lifting themselves up. And so he says to them, in church, while we have corporately gathered together, doesn't mean that there can't be any speaking in tongues, but yet if that tongue is so much prevalent that everyone around you hears it, then that tongue should be interpreted so that all can be edified. Or then we should prophesy so that all would be edified. But no way, shape, or form is Paul saying that we should not speak in tongues. Matter of fact, he says the opposite. He says, I speak in tongues more than all of you, and I would that you would all speak with tongues. But doesn't stop there. Ephesians 6, 18 says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication to all saints. What are we to do? We're to pray in the spirit often. Man, in this day and time that we live, a lot of people say, well, you know, it's not needful for us today because, you know, that dispensation's over. It's not needful for us today to do that because we have the word of God. Let me tell you something, man. If we need to pray in the spirit, it's today. If we ever needed to combat the enemy and lift up and be strengthened the inner man, battling anxiety, battling fears, dealing with the enemy and those things, yes, it absolutely. We have a more sure word of prophecy. That's the word of God. That's the written word. That's the word of God that we hear from him. But I want you to know right now, it is still important and vital and, and very strengthening for us that if we would pray in the spirit much. Romans 8, 26 through 28 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and those who are the called according to his purpose. When we are at a place to where, and I, I asked this last week to the class, sometimes we are at a place when we just do not know what to pray. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been at a place to where it just seemed like, man, you did not know what to pray? Well, that's one of the important aspects of having the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that is, 
that when we are at a place that we just don't know what to pray, or it seems like we're in such a battle, such a fight, that it's hard for us to pray. Man, the Bible says the Spirit of God can pray through us. We can pray in the Spirit, and we're praying to God, that the and the enemy doesn't know what we're praying, and we're praying the will of God over our lives. He makes intercession for us with groanings and utterances that cannot be understood. What a blessing that it is. Jude um, verse 20 says, but you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, praying in the Holy Spirit. That's the purpose of the Holy Spirit. The charismas, including the gift of tongues, are from God to man. Praying in tongues is from man to God. When we think about one of the gifts of the Spirit, one of the gifts of the Spirit is um, the gift of tongues and also the gift of interpretation of tongues. But when we talk about the gift of tongues, that is a supernatural ability that the Holy Spirit works through someone who may need it at the time to minister to somebody in another language, something that they have not learned. I have not only heard about that, I have seen that take place. In which somebody that did not know Spanish ministered to somebody by the Holy Spirit in Spanish and they did not know it. To me, that is, a, that is the main aspect of the gift of tongues. And that languages that you did not learn, God enables you at a time to be able to minister to somebody who you would not otherwise be able to minister. I, I, matter of fact, I know a, a, a pastor. Matter of fact, he's an overseer in uh, this organization that we're part of, Church God Prophecy. He w came on an accident one time as a young pastor and, and got out. To, in that accident, I believe I got the steps right, but if not, this you get the gist of it. He got out, and the people that were in the accident were Hispanic, and he did not speak Spanish. And the Lord enabled him to minister to them in Spanish and to touch their lives when, if it was not for the Holy Spirit working through him, he had never been able to do that. We need to look at these gifts that God has given them to us. But the importance of praying in tongues is that man, we, we are praying in tongues to God and God is hearing our cries and hearing our prayers and the enemy cannot combat that. The Holy Spirit is not necessarily an emotional experience. I think this is one of the things here that has um, really damaged um, the Pentecostal church uh, because people have looked at that as just an emotional outburst. Just like, sal just like our salvation, being born again, being regenerated, is not necessarily an emotional experience. It can be an experience where people cry. It can be an experience when people, are, when people break down. It can be all that. But, it, but emotion does not guarantee or does not solidify whether somebody really was born again. The emotional aspects of the Holy Spirit baptism is not what we're looking for. We're not looking for somebody to have an emotional outburst. It's not necessary, so to speak. Doesn't mean that there never will be any emotion. Doesn't mean that it never will take place. Doesn't mean that there's not some uh, manifestations that take place. But yet we want people to understand that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a walk. It's a way of life. It's the Holy Spirit walking through us. It's not based off of emotion. If something that we have, salvation, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, is based off of emotion, then when you are emotionally high, it's wonderful. But when you are emo going through a struggle, a battle, then where are you? If you have to have an emotion to feel that you're a Christian, then when things are going bad and you don't feel saved, where are you going to be at? So it's not by feeling. It's not by emotion. It's not, it's not about that. Some theologians contend that the Holy Spirit baptism is, is an ecstatic experience resulting from being induced into a state of emotional frenzy. They obviously are not speaking from experience and therefore are speaking out of hearsay, observation, or conjecture. Can somebody 
be tremendously affected by being under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. The Bible talks about us being drunk on new wine, which is not the new wine in the natural, but talking about the Holy Spirit. No doubt the disciples were affected under the influence of receiving, excuse me, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When they came out of the upper room, they were in such a way that people looked at them and thought that they may be drunk. But that is not necessarily how it always has to be or that it even is for the most part. Some believers who had an emotional experience accompany their receiving of the Holy Spirit baptism tend to dramatize it to such an extent that it causes seekers to believe it is necessary. It's a necessary ingredient. In other words, if I don't have this huge emotional outburst, I must have not received it. But the only initial evidence of receiving the Holy Spirit baptism doesn't have anything to do with emotions. The initial evidence is speaking in other tongues. There are some that have varying degrees of emotional experience with regard to both salvation and the Holy Spirit baptism and some that have little or none. The New Testament does not support that emotion is a necessary ingredient accompanying salvation or the Holy Spirit baptism. I used to have people say, well, they couldn't have given their hearts to the Lord because I didn't see no tears. Well, I mean, the Bible says that we, we, we repent of our sins and we confess our sins to God through faith, not tears. Many people have sought the Lord with tears, the Bible says, and found no repentance. It's by faith, by confessing with my mouth and believing in my heart. The Bible in nowhere, nowhere, when Jesus was coming along and he was speaking to the early disciples about following him, Nowhere does it say that they had some kind of emotional outburst that gave witness or testimony to the fact that they had repented. But I tell you what was the evidence that they had repented. They started to, be, they started to belong with Jesus. They felt they belonged with him. And then they started becoming um, what Jesus was because they asked him, help us to pray, teach us to pray, Lord. They wanted to become like him. And then the Bible says that that they um, became like him because they had been forgiven. So they had a part of that in their lives, but not because of an emotional outburst. Sometimes there are emotional experiences, but yet we have to be careful that we don't make it to where um, we make people feel like that that is the only um, way that they have that experience with God. Those seeking the Holy Spirit baptism need to be careful that they do not seek feeling instead of filling. The Spirit does not overpower the believer to speak in tongues. The believer chooses to do so by faith and what the Holy Spirit gives them. It's not a feeling. It's a filling. When we look at prerequisites in receiving the Holy Spirit baptism, we all know that salvation must happen first in our lives before anything else can follow. Baptism in water, baptism in the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us that hunger and thirst, those who seek will find. Those who hunger and thirst shall be filled. Scripture teaches us, John 4, 14, John 7, 37 through 59. Ask. He says you have not because you ask not. Those who ask shall receive. Received by faith. Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. We begin in Christ through faith and we continue in Christ through faith. Colossians 2, 6 through 8 states that. It's as you have therefore received Christ Jesus, so walk in him. So, so God teaches us, receive by faith, walk in faith. Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. And then last but not least, we have to yield our member. We must yield the most unruly of all of our members in faith unto the Holy Spirit. Romans 6.13, James 3.8, Acts 2.4 shows that we must do the speaking in faith and the Holy Spirit will form the word or utterances. Remember, faith without works is dead, James 2.17-20. Often when we talk about receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit, 
A lot of times people are hindered because of traditions of men or because of what they've been taught or because of embedded theology. But why don't you take a look at the scriptures that we have rattled off in this time that we've taught about the Holy Spirit baptism. Ask God, God, is this for me? Is this real? And I'm telling you, if you ask him, if you look, he'll tell you, yes, it's for you because he's already told us it's for you. It's for your, your, your family. It's for those that are far off, all of those who God will call to himself. Take a look at the scripture for yourself. Don't, don't trust in everything else that you might have heard or seen. Look at the book of Acts. Look at how they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then ask God. Believe when you ask that the Holy Spirit will do what you ask. God tells us in his word, if you ask, if you ask of your own father on earth, to give you a piece of bread. Would you give your son a serpent or a scorpion? No, he said. How much more than if you ask of your heavenly father will he give to you what you ask? Ask him to fill you with the Holy Spirit with the initial evidence of speaking in other tongues and listen to the utterance that the Holy Spirit gives you. And then no matter what that utterance sounds like, you speak that by faith and the Holy Spirit will make his residence in God wants to fill you today. We need to be spirit-filled, baptized believers today. Don't live below your privilege. Don't live as the Old Testament believers live. Walk in power today. Be filled with the Holy Spirit with the initial evidence of speaking in other tongues. Jesus is calling you. He's calling me to a deeper walk. I pray in the name of Jesus, everybody that's listening, to this broadcast, I pray right now, if you have not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I pray in Jesus' name, be filled with the Holy Spirit, with the initial evidence of speaking in other tongues. Be filled to overflowing and then go out and declare it to the rest of, the, of those that are around you. Jesus is more than enough. Father, I pray right now that you would touch every person that's under the sound of my voice, that you would minister to them. God, that you would move in their lives. Holy Spirit, baptize them right now in the name of Jesus with the initial evidence of speaking in other tongues. Holy Spirit, I pray right now, give a fresh baptism to all of us. God, we should be experiencing the fresh baptism, the fresh oil, all every day of our lives, praying in the Spirit much, walking in the Spirit, God, and allowing you to direct and move in our lives. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, do a work in our lives and we will give you all the glory and all the praise in Jesus' name. God bless you and thanks for joining with us today.